I'm Ben Bailey, and I believe our homegrown food is world class. The quality of our produce, the skill, creativity and passion of our people is second to none. There is more to the New Zealand food story than ever before. Here at Ahi, we are always striving to use the best local ingredients and tell the provenance of where it comes from. Food is more than fuel to power our bodies. Our food in New Zealand has a unique story. I want to experience its origins and the Kiwis behind it. Situated at the top of the Marlborough Sounds lies the small town of Havelock. I'm heading out to get the lowdown on one of New Zealand's most underrated ingredients, the humble mussel. Aquaculture to me is the primary industry of the future and clear water mussels are at the top of their game. I'm motoring deep into the Sounds to one of the company's many farms where the boss, John Young, is championing the cause. He has been a pioneer in the mussel farming industry for over 40 years and helps generate to Marlborough over $300 million. So this is the first time I've actually seen mussels getting pulled off a farm. It's pretty self-explanatory, but how, how long are those ropes that are underneath the water? So the depth and the sound varies. Sometimes we farm to six metres, down to 15 metres. Yeah. In this particular farm, these are 12 metre droppers. Yep. So 12 metres down, 12 metres up, yep. 6,000 metres on that line. This particular rope we're using, you can see mussels are really hanging on. So they're probably 8 kilos a metre. It's an exceptional farm. Wow. Um, because of the nutrients that come yep. down the river system, you know, yes. from, from Havelock. And it's just the particular siding of this farm makes it incredibly productive. So how old are these mussels? How long have they been on the rope for? Uh, from the seeding stage, initially growing them out for six months yes. beforehand, you know, from the microscopic spat. It's another 19, 20 months, yeah. these particular lines. So our average is about, if you take the sounds, all different varying productivity, but our average is 24 months. So greenlit mussels, they're a native mussel to New Zealand. This is the only native animal in New Zealand that we actually farm. Really? It's, it's incredible. Wow. It's, it's a filter feeder, it's just taking advantage of the nutrients that are yeah. here. It's basically living in the wild, and whatever comes on the current yeah. is what it feeds on. It's, it's so natural, it's an incredible system. It's incredible that most mussels are exported to over 76 countries, with the USA being number one. Mussels are super sustainable, leave a tiny footprint, and are super good for you. On that note, it's time to cook some and show the boys a few different ways. But first, I want to get a take on aquaculture and the future. And Donald has extensive knowledge in the industry. What a spot. Well, Marlborough Sounds. Mate, it's beautiful, eh? It's just we're, incredible. We're blessed. Donald, I, I feel like you're the spokesperson for aquaculture New Zealand. What is your vision for the future? And the future is very bright. Our muscle industry is strong. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited, mate. For me as a chef, like, I've, I've sort of come full circle on the aquaculture because I need to have product available for our guests. I need to have an awesome story to tell to our guests, too. Um, a story that's, um, that's good for the environment. It's, it's also financially sustainable for everybody. So I see aquaculture as a key part of the seafood business now for me. And the fact that it's a sustainable product, I mean, that's really exciting. I mean, you, you, you're putting that on your plate. It's nutritious. It's a very low impact on the environment. That's a good thing that we're doing, I believe. I mean, mussels themselves, like, it, I feel like they're underrated in New Zealand. And, and maybe it's because as Kiwis, you know, we grew up with them and, and we always had access to them. But you always can find a feed of mussels when you're out and about. I've just become to love the, the mussels, not only to eat, but also the fact of mm. how we grow them, what they do for the, you know, the, how they're good they are in the environment. And being sustainable like they are, I just think it's a, it's a great story and we just need to get it out there. Something else that has blown me away is the art form and skill of opening up the muscles the proper way. And Geordie is the best I've ever seen. All right, so I just create a lip there. Yeah. Push the knife in right to the back. Yeah. Come up and take the lip off the shell. Open it up. Straight around and take it out of the shell. Yeah. And then you've got your whole 
muscle sitting there. Bloody heck. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go right down the end. Yep. And then back of the knife to take that top lip off. Yep, right down. Oh, look at that. You're a pro already. Look at that. Natural. You got it. <laughs> You'll have the record next year. <laughs> <laughs> My chefs are in trouble when they get back, <laughs> eh? Uh, definitely. You've just added so much value to that muscle. It's become as valuable as an oyster to me right there. Yeah, I was just thinking. I'm inspired by the muscle. As at Ahi, we cook over a fire, which is exactly what I'm going to do with these for the first dish. Using an Italian vibe of chilli, onions and olives that I've cooked down. We'll just cook them in the shell, eh? Nice and simple. Yeah. yeah. I really love mussels with a bit of spice. I've taken some Italian spicy sausage, some chilli, some onions, some olives, and I've just sort of cooked it down. And I think we're just gonna tee these up along the fire here. Oh, they're looking pretty good, eh? <laughs> Yum. We're definitely gonna do a version of this. Mm. Oh, I could eat these all day. Mm. That's so good. Next dish, the classic mussel broth. Onions, garlic, tomatoes, a splash of Marlborough salve. Herbs, pop the mussels in. Simple and delicious. We're just going to eat these mussels like this once they've all opened up. And then we're going to make mussel noodle soup. Give it a quick wash. I'm also a fan of the mussels' nutritional value. When you are feeling a bit sick, instead of reaching for the chicken soup, try swapping it out for mussel soup. Yeah, you get it from Akaroa. So using my leftover stock, I'm going to make a mussel ramen. All right, guys. Hook in. <laughs> classy. Classy, John. Classy. That's it. Japanese style. They've got to suck. They've got to have lots of air. Delicious. Thank you, guys. It's been inspiring just to come here. I mean, mussels at face value in the supermarket don't look exciting, but when you come and you see the process, you hear the story, uh, you cook them on the fire right in front of the, the mussel farm, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so a big part of what we do is, is telling that story to our guests that come to the restaurant. So thank you so much for, for your knowledge and, and sharing your time, it's, it's amazing. What you've done with these mussels are some of the nicest mussels we've ever eaten. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, mate. Coming up, I head to Waipara to meet an award-winning farmer who is doing outstanding things with his land and the animals that he grazes upon it. I'm heading deep into North Canterbury to Waipara to meet a guy who is not only an award winner, he is also doing incredible things with his land and the animals that he is raising. Starting with the amazing ostrich. Ian, how are you? G'day, Ben. Yes, thanks. You're good. Good to see you. Wow, what incredible birds. I think this might be the first time I've seen one in the flesh up close like this. It's probably about as close as you want to get to the male ones. The, the females are pretty friendly, but the males, the black ones, are uh, pretty protective wow. of their paddock and their girls. They're just majestic birds. Look at their feet are just incredible. Uh, quite uh, prehistoric looking, aren't they? I'm kind of spellbound, you know, like they're just so they're just so phenomenal, aren't they? We're just lucky they don't have teeth because they are pretty big and dominating. They're pretty inquisitive, they're really curious, so they're um Oh they're good, they're good fun to have around, but you mind your earlobes, they're pretty fond on those nice Does soft that bits. Hurt? Oh yeah, that's all right. Yeah. We're lucky they don't have teeth. Yeah. They're pretty they're actually pretty gentle. What do they like to keep? Are they are they quite low maintenance? So when they're young, we actually take the eggs away from the parents and hatch them under an incubator and a brooder just to because they're used to being in a hot desert yes. sort of environment, which is not always the case in, in New Zealand. When they're little, we give them quite a bit of care and, and the right feed and warmth. But then once they get to this size, they're almost bulletproof. Like they, wow. they, they really do well in our climate. Ten years ago as a chef, ostrich meat was super cool and easy to get, but not these days. Hopefully things are about to turn. Do you think this is something that we could have a little side deal? Like between me and you, you know, I get access to ostrich that I could have on the menu for like a month. You know, we could have ostrich month or something, I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure, we can work at something. At the moment, we're trying to collect up the eggs this time of year and breed them up to get enough um, birds on the ground that we can actually supply products. So it's, it's, it's a classic chicken and egg, isn't it? All the ostrich <laughs> and the egg. 
Hello, you are so gorgeous, yes. Keep an eye on the male, and all the rest of them should be pretty friendly. Look how they prance. It's like a little tango, look. <laughs> Hello. Oh, yes. She's very calm today. Wow. You've obviously got away with birds. <laughs> I feel like an omelette for breakfast. It looks more like a honeydew melon than an egg, doesn't yeah, it? <laughs> it does. M most eggs that are, have a real point to them is to stop them rolling out of the nest. But because ostriches come, I guess, from the desert where it's mostly flat, oh, really? they just make a little scrape in the ground. So they're not great nest builders by any stretch of the imagination. So they have a, almost a round egg because it's not going to roll anywhere. It's just sitting on the flat ground. I thought an egg would be that shape because it's easier to come out of its butt. <laughs> Let alone, you know what I mean? I haven't even pushed an egg out myself. <laughs> I mean, it'd be the ultimate thing to throw at a politician or someone you didn't like, right? It's one of those moments when you first experience something, especially a food item like this, or even, you know, an animal, it's, it just blows your mind to think how old this bird is, where it's come from, the journey it's taken to even get in New Zealand. It's one of those wow moments, eh? It, it's like they don't fit here, but then after a while, once you see them in this environment and knowing that, you know, Moa used to be through here yeah. back in the day, that, that they seem like they actually fit in quite well, really. And they certainly enjoy being here. Back you. Mind your earlobes, because it does hurt. Ah! <laughs> this might be the new version of the bird scary movie. Ian is outstanding and is passionate about his land and everything that grows on it. It's a testament to his work ethos and purpose. Been a lot of farms in my life, but I think this might be the most beautiful. I'm not just saying that. Yeah, it is a special place. We um, bought this farm in the early 2000s and I came up with my mum and dad to visit. Yeah, as soon as we came on this place, it just sort of gripped us. You've won a Balanced Farm Environment Award. What sort of things are you doing for the environment here around sustainability to, to win that? The key thing really is just trying to match your production with the environment. Try to work with nature and not keep fighting against it. And making sure that we don't make any mess or mud that we graze on and off. Make sure the stock have got enough to eat while the soil is being protected as well. There's a lot of work goes into soil testing and making sure we only ever put on the amount of nutrient that we need for optimum growth, just to try to optimise it to get a good balance between what nature provides and what we need to top it up with. So the bills are paid by the sheep and the cattle. That's, yes. that's the business enterprise. There's a few other non-commercial activities. So I, I studied genetics and have always been really interested in nature and what's happening in the world. So there's ostriches and peacocks and alpacas and goats and deer and lots of other animals that are just nice to have. Ian lets his mates onto the farm to hunt deer, rabbits, pheasants, and sample the goods which helps keep the farm in balance. Oh, I'm just completely blown away, to be honest. Oh, I'm pleased you're enjoying it. It would have been awkward otherwise, eh? <laughs> it's very inspiring. You know, you're always in life looking for inspiration, especially when you're in an industry that you have to be creative. But coming back to the roots of, of where food comes from is just so important. And, and, and it gives you so much more energy to create new things back in Auckland. And vice versa, when you get people yes. like yourself that actually tell the story and put it on a plate and bring people mm. together, it's like, OK, no, it is something special. It's not just a commodity. So often, I guess, for you guys, you know, an animal disappears off farm, and you never know where the bloody hell it's going. And, and then at the other end, you've got a chef cooking in the kitchen, he doesn't bloody know where the thing came from. There's such a disconnect, and I guess that's what this show's about in a way, is connecting those dots. There's too much in the middle there and you never know the full journey yeah. of products. Ostrich October at Ahi sounds like a great idea to me. And I already have a few ideas. It's time to get creative. So it's gotta be the biggest drumstick known to man. Boom. Dunk that in some buttermilk and then roll it in the secret herbs and spices. I reckon we cook this like a steak, eh? It really is different meat, isn't it? I know this is tender just by the way the knife's going through it. it kind of looks like a bit of tuna, actually. Oh, this, Look at this, that! Yeah. Are we in? 
It's beautiful. It's so good, but the texture's really unusual, isn't it? Mm. It's not gamey at all, let's face it. It's not like beef, it's not like venison, it's not like it. It's so unique. The ostrich, it's so lean, so we're gonna try a little ostrich tartare. So I'm just gonna dice up some of these beautiful bits of muscle here. My plan is to cut the shell perfectly so I can serve the tartare back in the shell. What the hell? I'm absolutely speechless. This animal is incredible. So imagine it goes to the table and it's like, sort of like that. All right. It is. It's a bloody ripper. Mm. We have to put this on the menu. Well, before you go, Ben, you've seen the adult birds and the eggs, but you missed a bit in the middle. Would you like to see some day old chicks? I'd love to. It's so cool. Right, come on, they're in by the fire, keep them warm. Oh, awesome. I can't wait. Where it all starts. Oh my gosh. So these are only a day old, so they've got a hot water bottle and they're just sitting here by the fire. Oh my gosh, look at it. It looks like a porcupine with a head. You just want to cry, don't you? They're so they're cute. Very cute. And they're great natured, we guys. They make wonderful pets at this age. And you look at the feet on it, it's just. So these are a day old. They're huge. Thank you. I think this might be the best farm in all the world. I've learned so much, and it's just so important that I, you know, I visit people like you. Look at it. Coming up, I finally get to meet the man himself, the barefoot hippie and peanut butter baron. While I'm on my South Island adventure, I took the opportunity to stop and see Bruce Pick Pico, the genius behind Pick's Peanut Butter. After my trip to Northland, I really wanted to check out the factory, as this is truly an incredible New Zealand food story. However, COVID finally caught up with Pick's, but thankfully his mate and business partner, Stuart McIntosh, was on hand to let me have a look around. Thanks for having us here in Nelson. I mean, what an amazing facility. We've just been up north, um, seeing the beginnings of this, I guess, peanut plantation and, and the Great Plains Northland has. But at the moment, I mean, talk us through the procurement process for taking peanuts from overseas. Historically, we used to import all of our peanuts from Australia. Four years ago, it was getting drier and drier, and one year they informed us that they could only supply half of what we required. So we had to pivot and find a you know, peanut somewhere else in the world with one eye on uh, Northland, getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Is that a, a great opportunity for you guys? Well, it certainly is. It's more viable to grow peanuts there, but the other side of it all is also the varieties that they've got now. So there are some faster maturing varieties. So that means that the potential viability of growing them in Northland is something that's more, more likely to happen. The nature of the peanut, because of the higher lack oil, that it's a naturally preserved. You think yeah. of it like a bottle of olive oil. I mean, yes. nothing goes into olive oil either. Yeah. So it's it's a you know quite a unique product that you can do that with. The factory opened in 2019, giving away 37,000 free tours to peanut butter lovers, helping to become a $50 million New Zealand success story and winning sustainable awards in tourism. And the product is good for you. Mm. Oh my god. Good um, eye. It's amazing. That's really good. What an incredible place. They've turned the humble peanut into the most delicious peanut butter as well as a tourist destination. It's given me an idea. I'm gonna put a Pix inspired dish on the menu at Ahi and invite Pick to come in and taste it when he gets better. And four weeks later, the day has finally come and the man himself could come to Ahi. Hello, Hello, mate. You made it. Oh, I did, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so, wonderful to be here. It's so good to yeah. finally meet you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Peanuts, you never associate with a New Zealand food story. And after visiting the farm, visiting your factory, how did you come up with this idea? Like, how did you think that crushing peanuts and making peanut butter was a, a great business decision in, in New Zealand. I never thought of it as a business decision. I was just, I like peanut butter, and I was really, really? cross with the crap that we were getting <laughs> in, the, in the shops, you know? 
they were adding sugar to it and they were also adding emulsifiers and various you know other things so it was only sort of not 85 90 percent peanuts uh, so it was unnecessary no and no, that was horrible it made it taste bad you know wow so it wouldn't separate, it didn't separate in the jar, so who cares if separate? You can mix it. Yes, yes. So we have hands it. full. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and amazingly well received. Oh, it was. Yes, from the get-go, you know, we sort of started selling at the Nelson Market and, and, and I sold out the first week, went back the next week, sold out. And I was just very happy to keep the lid on it, just sort of make, you know, just make have demand a little bit ahead of supply, not get too stressed. And the way that Nelson people and the New Zealand people are taking it to heart, you know, that yes. the real, there's a real involvement there. And, it's iconic. It is. It's pretty. It's crazy, being famous for being a peanut butter guy. You know, it's really bizarre. <laughs> yeah. I see this as a real inspiring story for New Zealanders. Yeah. There might be people out there that have a product similar to to your peanut butter story. I mean, how did you scale this up? We just did it a bit at a time. You know, we started off with a little. You know, the, the concrete mixer, roasting a concrete, concrete mixer. mixer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went from that, and then I bought some hideous sort of look like crematorium machines from China. And that was scary. I spent about 50K and I couldn't afford to lose that if I did. Yes. But that was scary and that, I, and that worked. We made it work. And the next stage where I tipped everything I had into it and, and started buying stuff, I knew it was going to work. You know, I had the confidence. And, and, and that's been how it's gone. You know, you just, just take one step at a time and, yeah. and things eventually happen. Oh, look at that. Hell, pick. this is Mike, our executive chef. Uh, Kia ora, Mike. Nice to meet you, yes. finally. Did you make this? I did, yes. Wow. Using your butter. Oh, it looks amazing. What? Do you want to give a little explanation? Sure, sure, sure. So we've got um, fermented pig's peanut butter, a little brace power, emulsified with... Uh, power? Like, yeah, a little baby power, queen oh, power. Golly. Uh, celery mayonnaise and some peanuts toast and uh, smoked seaweed. Oh, wow. A little crumpets, yeah. Enjoy. Oh, Thanks, cool. Mate. Appreciate it. Hey. Oh, that's amazing. Fermented peanut butter. Mm. To you, mate. It's beautiful. What a beautiful story. Oh, fantastic. Mmm. It's amazing. A New Zealand food story was brought to you by Balance Farm Environment Awards. Promoting sustainable farming and growing.